A relatively small operator-guided short-range air defense system has reappeared on the contemporary battlefield and, in doing so, has offered a sharp practical lesson for Australian defense planners. The RBS-70, a Swedish-designed, laser-guided, man-portable and vehicle-mounted system that Australia procured decades ago and later upgraded, has been employed in Ukraine as a pragmatic counter to low-level threats, tactical helicopters, low, slow, small, unmanned aerial systems, and certain types of loitering munitions. Its wartime record there is not miraculous, but it is instructive. The system's deployment highlights the enduring value of precision, operator control, and mobility in a context where cheap, proliferated aerial threats can suddenly alter operational calculus. For a nation like Australia, whose strategic environment is shifting rapidly in the Indo-Pacific, the experience of RBS-70 in Ukraine should prompt sober reflection about force posture, sustainment, and the architecture of layered air defense. At the tactical level, the RBS-70 demonstrates several virtues that remain relevant. It is inherently mobile and can be employed to protect forward bases, logistic nodes, and moving formations where heavier, Fixed systems cannot be deployed quickly or cost-effectively. Unlike passive or fire-and-forget infrared missiles, the RBS-70 family uses operator-maintained laser guidance, which allows engagement of small, low-signature targets that might evade heat-seeking seekers. In Ukraine, that capacity proved useful against certain classes of drones and against low-flying aircraft operating in contested littoral and riverine environments. The system's precision reduces fratricide and collateral risk when employed in complex populated areas, an increasingly common feature of modern conflict. These attributes make RBS-70 type systems a logical choice for navies and armies that must protect high-value dispersed assets in the face of asymmetric aerial threats. Yet the operational record also exposes clear limitations. The RBS-70 is manpower intensive. Its effectiveness is directly linked to the skill and endurance of the crew. Under sustained high tempo operations, operator fatigue, target saturation, and ammunition expenditure present acute concerns. Each engagement consumes a finite stock of missiles. In prolonged campaigns, logistics and sustainment quickly become the constraining factor. In Ukraine, where attrition rates of munitions have been driven by sheer volume, this problem is non-trivial. Moreover, no single short-range system can substitute for a coherent, integrated air defense network. Systems like RBS-70 are most potent when nested within a layered architecture that includes medium-range sensors and interceptors and when fused into a resilient command and control fabric that can deconflict fires and manage sensor coverage across domains. For Australian defense policy, the lessons are practical and immediate. First, Australia should retain and modernize a cadre of mobile short-range air defense capabilities. Whether legacy RBS-70 launchers where surplus exists or contemporary equivalents, because they deliver a cost-effective hedge against rapidly proliferating aerial threats that can appear at the tactical edge. Second, sustainment planning must be taken as seriously as platform acquisition. A stockpile of launchers without reliable supply lines of missiles, spares, and trained crews is of limited utility in a protracted crisis. Budgetary planning must therefore capture the full life cycle cost of shored, training, munitions, maintenance, and the logistic tail, rather than treating missiles as simple, one-line purchase items. Third, training and human factors ought to be central to capability choices. Laser-guided, operator-dependent systems demand higher standards of crew selection, simulator fidelity, and recurrent training than many fire-and-forget systems. If Australia expects to derive asymmetric advantage from such systems, it must invest in education and realistic exercises that stress crews under simulated cognitive and physical fatigue. 
The Ukrainian experience underscores that technological capability without organization and training will underperform when confronted with creative and saturated threats. Fourth, the strategic implication is that Australia's air defense posture must remain layered and networked. Short-range systems buy time and provide a last line of defense, but they do not obviate the need for robust medium-range air defense systems and integrated sensor networks, precisely the rationale for Australia's investment in systems like NASAMS and for deeper interoperability with allies. Shorage should be complementary, a distributed mobile layer that complicates enemy targeting, protects convoys and positions, and buys decision space for higher-end interceptors. The RBS-70 case in Ukraine illustrates that the adversaries will not be deterred by single-axis defenses. They will probe, swarm, and exploit seams. Australia's approach must therefore be systemic rather than piecemeal. There is also an industrial and procurement lesson. Australia benefits from cultivating sovereign capacity in counter-UAS sensors, munitions manufacturing, and integration software for C2. The quick adaptation of commercial drones into weapon systems in Ukraine reveals an innovation asymmetry. Inexpensive commercial technologies can be weaponized faster than procurement cycles can field bespoke countermeasures. Encouraging domestic firms to develop modular, upgradable counter-UAS and shore-ed solutions that can be rapidly scaled is both a strategic imperative and an economic opportunity. Public-private partnerships, streamlined regulatory pathways, and sustainment contracts that incentivize long-term investment will help close that gap. Finally, policy choices should reflect strategic humility. The RBS-70's utility in Ukraine does not imply that Australia should pivot away from medium and long-range investments. Instead, it argues for balance, retain some legacy or low-cost mobile capabilities to manage immediate tactical risk while persevering with high-end programs that shape strategic deterrence. In the Indo-Pacific, where distances are vast and the maritime domain dominates, Australia's force design must reconcile the need for sovereign strike and deterrence with the equally pressing need to protect dispersed forces against proliferated, low-cost threats. The Ukrainian experience with RBS-70 is therefore a corrective to any hubris that technology alone can secure a force. It is a reminder that capability is a product of hardware, human performance, logistics, and doctrine. For Australian defence planners, the question is not whether to possess short-range air defence systems, but how to integrate them sensibly into a layered architecture, how to resource sustainment adequately, and how to build the human and industrial base that converts equipment into enduring combat power. Those are the strategic decisions that will determine whether lessons from distant battlefields become durable improvements to Australia's security, rather than ephemeral anecdotes.